sins began in the garden of Eden, man has been separated from God. And God is trying to prepare for us a place like the garden of Eden, without sin, without any type of adversity among the children of God. We will live in a place of paradise, a place that God is preparing for us. And Christ said, when it's prepared, he'll come back and gather his bride to, the, to his heavenly Father. What the, the hope is that this thing gives us ever since the first sin was committed in the Garden of Eden, God has been working to restore the relationship that He had with Adam and Eve to a relationship that He will have with the church. And this chapter 21 and chapter 22 gives us a side of what we're to expect, what will happen to the just, to the faithful, to the bride of Christ who uh, overcomes sin and death. So I'm going to read a little bit of the chapter and then I want to expand a, a little bit more on it. Uh, I, I want to take at least a couple or maybe three Sundays discussing chapter 21 because it is the accumulation of everything that the church has went through from its beginning uh, on the day of Pentecost till the destruction and, and the destroying of Satan, which does away with all of the negative part of human life. We'll no longer be tempted. We'll no longer sin. We'll no longer have sin in our background. We will be a, a individual that will rise at the resurrection to a spiritual body, and we will all gather together in the sky with Christ. We will be like He is. And when He was on the earth after His resurrection, He was just like you and I in the physical existence. They knew Him. They, they, when they first realized who, who He was, they didn't realize it. But then as time progressed, days went by, they recognized that He was the resurrected Christ as He had promised. Uh, pick up a bulletin and make note of those that are asking for prayer. We need to keep uh, Shirley Smith in our prayers. She's having a difficult time, a uh, period of time of loss, and her physical uh, welfare is also a problem she's dealing with. So let's keep her in our prayers. All these others, uh, the niece by marriage uh, of Barry, Meadows is also asking for prayer. She's been diagnosed with leukemia, and we need to keep her in our prayer. She's only 30 years old, and her mother passed away several years ago. She has started chemo and will stay at UAV for about 30 days to start her treatments, and then perhaps they can do it more local, and she won't have to travel this far. Let's go to God in a word of prayer and thank God for the blessings that we have and give God uh, the uh, honor and, and the privilege that He deserves in studying Him and worshiping Him. Our Heavenly Father, we approach Thy throne of grace at this hour. We're mindful, Father, of those who are sick, especially those of the household of faith, those our number here at Grand Street. We pray, Father, that you would be with them, comfort them, and strengthen them, and help them to regain enough strength to take up their place in life. Help them, Father, as they overcome uh, sickness and overcome the loss of a loved one. We pray, Father, that as we study your word this morning, that you will give us uh, an understanding of the things that we've studied and help us to prepare it and give it to a way in which those who listen will be able to understand and be able to take those things that we study and uh, meditate upon them and apply them to their lives. We pray, Father, for Christ who came to this earth, who died on the cross, who resurrected on the third day and ascended into you after 40 days of 
of traveling on earth. We pray, Father, and we thank you for his sacrifice. We know that he is our high priest who is at the right hand of you, who intercedes for man, who intercedes from this world, physical existence of man's life in order that we might have a better relationship with you. We pray, Father, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts might this day and always be in accordance with your will. And we ask this prayer in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. I read a little bit uh, through the 8th verse of this 21st chapter of Revelation last week, and I want to go back and kind of expand a little bit on it, and then we'll probably end with the 8th verse again. Uh, it's important to remember that the influences of Satan has now decreased. He has been, uh, as it were, chained for a period of time. It is believed to be the earth, the uh, church era that he has been uh, limited to as to the influence that he had. Now that doesn't mean that we're not capable of sin because we are. That's human nature. But we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who died for <coughs> us, who redeemed us, who has prepared a place for us to be with him forever and forever if we remain faithful. He sent his son to suffer and to die, to overcome the power of sin and death, and to begin the process of healing in those who love to overcome the power of sin and death, and to begin the process of healing those who love him. If we love Christ, and if we remain faithful to Christ, the outcome will be greater than any human can express. Uh, Paul went to the third heaven and he came back in the spirit and he could deliver unto man what he saw, the beauty and the grandeur of what heaven is going to be like. It's, it's, we don't have the vocabulary to express. John did the very best he could do here with the, the help of the angel that uh, was given to him to help him write this letter. We noticed in the first part, Christ was the one that was speaking to John. But then as we begin to read in this book, we see angels coming to him and explaining to him what he is looking at and what he is seeing. So he was then able to write down uh, on scrolls to give to the seven churches of Asia and as a result of that, we have the privilege to know what John saw. We have the privilege to understand what the significance of his uh, vision was. It was to give a warning and to give a hope to a lost and dying world. To give hope to the church to continue to be steadfast, unmovable, always abiding in the faith. And then he warns those who do not accept him as Christ, a warning that they will be destroyed at a time and a period in which God the Father has uh, given, has thought of, and knows when the time will come. But Christ did not even know when he would return to this earth. But he will return and gather his bride, present his bride to his heavenly Father. It's God's will that all the old things of human nature is done away with. He makes a new heaven and a new earth. And notice this new heaven and this new earth is coming down from heaven. Nowhere in Scripture does it teach us that it's going to be on this earth. There are a lot of denominational people who bow up and down that this Scripture gives us the uh, proof that heaven and earth will be on this earth that we know. We know that it will be a place wherever it is of, of blissfulness, of joy, of happiness, 
of no more sin, no more death, no more heartaches, no more departing from one another. It'll be a place that we can only imagine what it would be like when we enter into that city that uh, He is preparing for us. He will free our soul and our spirit from the bondage of sin. Now, when we receive Christ as our Savior and we hear the truth, we obey the truth, we acknowledge that Christ is the Son of God, we repent of our sins and we're baptized into the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and we come up from that watery grave, we put on a new inward person, a new inward spirit, a spirit that gives life, gives hope, gives renewing of our souls and our spirits, and we're changed into a, a better person, into a, a person who does the things that God requires of us to do, and that is to spread the gospel to the lost and the dying world. Now John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, in Peter's letter that he wrote, he made mention that this world would be destroyed by fire, that it would be consumed by a fire and be totally destroyed. So then the new heaven and the new earth, we don't know where that will be, uh, but it will exist, and we will be uh, in that community of the same if we have been found faithful. It's up to us to remain faithful. It's up to us to remain uh, to the awareness that God has asked us to do things and we must do them according to His will in order that we might receive these blessings. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. There will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for all these former things have passed away, and all things become new. We are a new creature. We have a, a, a new spirit, a new soul that God gives us, and our bodies will be as Christ is. We will be as He is. When we see Him, we shall be changed like Him. So whatever He appears like is what we, our souls and spirit will be like. And we don't know what that's like. Now the apostles saw Him when He was resurrected. He had a, a spiritual body and a spiritual uh, soul and all that was within Him. And He was able to communicate with people. He was able to eat with the apostles. He was able to communicate with those who were able and were willing to listen to it. So our bodies will be a spiritual body. These things are in the spirit world. And the heaven and the earth is a spirit place that God is preparing. We don't know where it will be. We only know that it will be with God, wherever God is. God is in the third heaven, uh, sitting on the throne. And Christ is on the right hand of Him, making intercessions for you and I. And John said, I saw upon the throne one that said, I make all things new. And He said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. I am first and I am the last. I am the beginning and I am the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. 
And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second day. So those who have died outside of the will of God and not in, in the faithfulness of a child of God will suffer greatly for the sins that he's committed. And this place has been prepared also for Satan and his angels that fell from heaven when they made war against Michael. But we can choose to stop our soul from going to this place if we worship God, if we serve God, if we teach the will of God, if we live our life to the very best that we possibly can, and if we do not yield to temptation, and when we yield to temptation, we ask for forgiveness, we become new again when we are forgiven of our sins. And we will commit them because we're human and still in this physical existence. If we rely on Him, He can restore our life back to the way in which He wanted it to be. Now, the inward man is the only thing that changes. The soul and the spirit changes when we become a child of God. The outward appearance does not change. It exists as it was when we went into the watery grave of baptism. But when we're raised to a newness of life, it does not mean our life it, our physical existence changes. It means our soul and our spirit has changed. Then he talks about in verse 9, as he, as he witnessed the new heaven and the earth, new earth, he talks about the new Jerusalem, which in the 21st chapter in verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now, who is the bride of Christ? The church. It's not a physical Jerusalem as we know of the, the Jerusalem on earth here. But Jerusalem here means the church. It is a word used to express to, to humanity that God is looking forward to having Christ reunited with His bride. The new Jerusalem. That is who we are representatives of a spiritual uh, Jerusalem. And there came unto me one of the seven angels and had the seven vials of full of seven glass plagues. And I talked with this angel, saying, Come hither, and I will show you the bride and the Lamb's wife. Now he's going to show John what this new Jerusalem is all about. It's about the bride of Christ. It's not about a place. It's not about a Jerusalem as we know it in, on, on this earth. But the new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. It is what is represented as the bride of Christ. Now when John writes this letter, he's writing to the churches of Asia. And he has to use symbolism. He has to use numbers. He has to use all the different types of symbolism that he possibly can in order that if they were intercepted by the Roman uh, guards, they would look at this scroll and they would not even understand what was on that. So they would roll it back up and hand it to the carrier and the carrier would go on, on his way. But had they written down specific things in the world in which they lived, then they would have been killed and the, the document would be destroyed. But in order to pass along what God wants the churches to do, they have to be written in symbols and numbers. And that's where a lot of people misunderstand the book of Revelation. The thousand year reign deals with the thousand year of the Christian era. Now, we don't know how God uh, measures time, 
But it's not like our time. John could have said a thousand days, or he could have said two thousand years. But again, he uses symbolism in order that they may not understand what he's talking about. And this is what the book teaches us. It's very simple to understand. And I don't think anybody should be afraid to read it. I don't think they should be afraid to meditate on it, to study it. It answers itself. Every verse will answer itself after it has given a, a statement. When the angel appeared to John to show him this new place that God is preparing for his children, John is, is perhaps lost with words to express the beauty of it. We know that the city is, is going to be built with walls around it. There will be gates around it. There will be um, 12 apostles will have a place. 12 patriarchs will have a place. Uh, a, a way in which we are to greet when we meet that uh, uh, city. And the eternal city has 12 <coughs> gates to the city. Now a lot of people talk about it's impossible to build a wall around an area, but all of the ancient cities had a wall. They had walls, they had uh, moats built around them where people couldn't easily access and get over and cause harm. So the wall is not impossible to build. The new heaven is going to have seven walls, have seven gates that you can go through. And the gates representing the 12 tribes of, of uh, Israel. It also represents the 12 apostles. So these individuals will be at the foundation of the stones representing the 12 apostles of Christ in this city. The bride represents the people of God. It represents the souls that have become a member of the body of Christ and have died. And their faith has carried them through the, the hardships of this world and the hardships of the things that we endure, the sickness, the death, and all the things that this world offers to humanity because of sin will be done away with. There'll be no more sorrows. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more death. So God will be there and He will be on His throne. We will worship Him as these angels worship Him and as these people who were under the altar worshiped Him. They bowed and they praised God the Father they blessed him and they, they showed respect to him. And the only ones that were under the altar were the ones that were wondering when God was going to avenge their death. And he, they asked God, when are you going to avenge our death? And God tells them, a little season more. You must wait. And we don't know what the season of God's time is. We don't know what the here the time God is. We know it's not like our time. We know that 365 days a year is not what God considers a year. We don't know what He considers as, as a he's, he's without time. He is from the beginning to the end, the Alpha and the Omega. He was there when the creation was made. He'll be there when it is destroyed. He'll, he'll be there when the church is raised to a, a area where it's being prepared for us. John 14, chapter, Christ tells his apostles, I must go away. In order to go away, I will prepare for you a place. And if I prepare for you a place, in Revelation, the 21st chapter, he is preparing the city. He's got everything in order. But there's still something that is lacking or Christ would have come back. So the, he's building it, and building it is a, a, a motion of things being done. And it will be perfect. And there'll be no more Satan. Satan will be destroyed. And all of his angels who have influenced the church, who was persecuting the church during this time John writes his letter, 
the, uh, the Roman government was persecuting the church severely. What a wonderful picture of grace chapter 21 teaches us. Grace is unmerited favor of God to humanity. Grace is something that we rely on, that we uh, put our faith in, that we put our hopes in. And here we see it as being uh, described as the bride of Christ. What a wonderful picture it shows us. No matter how many mistakes we make in this life, we have redemptive salvation that is afforded to us. But we must choose ourselves of that salvation. It's not imposed upon us. It is taught to us to expect what we need to do in order to become uh, saved and enter into this city that God is preparing. The symbol here represents the bride, the lamb's wife, the church. In Romans, the seventh chapter, and in verse 4, the Apostle Paul teaches us that the bride of Christ is the church. That's what it represents. The foundations of the city rest on the twelve apostles, according to Ephesians, the two, second chapter, verse 20. The citizens of the city walk in light. There's no darkness there. If you look at 1 John, the first chapter, verses 5 through 7, it teaches us about Christ being the light. There's no need for uh, the sun. There'll be no need for any light because Christ is the light. The occupants of the city are written in the book of life. You remember the two books that we read about in the first part of this? If your name is written down in the book of life, then you are a saved child of God. That doesn't mean that we don't still have problems, we'll still have temptations, we'll still have sickness, there'll still be death that we will experience unless Christ comes back first before that time happens. Now the tree of life is, is a tree that gives healing to the nation. It is something that uh, God refers to as a healing substance. To enter this city, we must obey the commandments of God. There's no other way we can enter. We cannot buy our way in. We cannot, uh, by power, enter into the city. It is by the commandments that we honor God, that we live for in our godly walk with Christ in this life will determine our destination in the world to come. It's your choice. You can make it a way that is acceptable to God, or you can make it in a way that follows Satan and all of the destructive power that he has. Uh, it's up to us. Our name can be removed from the book of life. Just because it's written down in that book of life does not mean that it will remain there forever. We will determine whether it remains there forever. The way we live our life, the way we conduct our lives, the way that we do the things that God commands us to do here by the Bible, which is our blueprint for the things that yet to come if we are re uh, remain a child of God. God wants us to see the value of His church. He wants the city and the church and the spiritual city built by God. It's a place where people who have their sins forgiven by the blood of Christ. Only Christ can forgive us of our sins if we obey Him, if we acknowledge that He is the Son of God. You see, in the Roman era, a period of time, and even in the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees of that day, they could not acknowledge that Christ was the Son of God. So you can imagine that would be the first foremost thing that Christ requires of humanity, is to acknowledge the fact that Christ is the Son of God. The only begotten Son, according to John the third chapter, verse 16, where the he is the only begotten Son. We are adopted children. Christ is our brother. 
we are, we are adopted into his abode, into the way where he lives. And by being adopted, we, are, we have accepted Christ as our Savior. We have accepted the things that he has taught us to do. Christ did not come to set up a physical kingdom. That's what the Roman government was concerned about. He was concerned about the fact that he was going to have an uprising of the Jewish race. He was going to uh, fix a throne in the city of Jerusalem and rule there uh, forever. That's what they, they were looking for, an earthly king. But Christ did not come to become an earthly king. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom, one that would have no ending to it, one that would be forever and forever and forever. And we don't know what forever time it is. We know that it, it, whatever God decides that we need the time period, then that will happen. So we look at the church as being the bride of Christ, according to the 21st chapter, and he was the lamb of Christ, beginning with the book of Revelation. He was the bride that came down to the earth to be a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. Here in chapter 21 and chapter 22, we're going to be introduced into the place that he's preparing for us. The beauty and the grandeur. John writes down in this, these last two chapters. It's interesting to note that the first three chapters dealt with the church and its problems in that day. Each church was mentioned in Asia. Then it goes from the church to the individual. It goes to the individual's responsibility to become a child of God and remain a child of God. And when we do that, our names are written in the book of life. But that does not mean it stays there forever. It can be taken out. It can be erased. But once we repent and come back to Christ, then it is rewritten in the book of life. So, once saved, always saved is not taught in Scripture. We're taught that we sin and we are asked forgiveness of our sins and God will grant that. But that does not mean that just because we become a child of God, we remain whatever we do in life. Whatever sins we commit will not be held against us. But you see, the Bible doesn't teach that. Nowhere in Scripture does it teach that once you become a child of God, there's nothing that you can do that will erase your name from that book of life. You repent and you go on. So we see that here, that only the saved ones, the ones that obey the commandments of God, will be the, the inhabitants of, of the new heaven and the new earth. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, in verse 18, Christ says he came to establish a spiritual kingdom, the church. The church, though it is physical here, we are members of the church, there is a spiritual aspect of that statement. It is a spiritual church, but it is an earthly church because we are here in this physical existence. We're living in a Christian era that has become the last era that humanity will exist. And when this era is completed at a time which God has recommended and a time which God has established, when that time comes to an end, then we will inherit the blissfulness of heaven that we cannot comprehend the beauty of it nor of the, the living without worrying about being tempted by Satan. For all the past things will be done away with, and all the new things will become new. And that's our hope. That's our prayer. That we remain faithful unto death. And we will inherit this city as an inhabitant of it, a citizen of it, if we are faithful until death.
Next week, I'm going to pick up with verse 9, and we're going to talk about what this real uh, church, the, the city of Jerusalem represents the church, what it will be like when we get there to that place that God is preparing for us. I appreciate your attention, and uh, we'll pick up on the ninth verse of the 21st chapter.